Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont Show. Before I talk about our wonderful guests and friend, I want to talk about some upcoming events that we're having through um, Service Running Incorporated and Art So Wonderful on our, on our program. So on April 1st, we're working on, um, we're doing a fair housing event at the City of Burlington Contours Auditorium, working with CVOEO. And um, it, um, April, April is fair housing. And so what we're gonna do there is that youth get a chance to, to um, paint a picture, paint a, or draw a picture about what fair housing mean to them. We're gonna hang these art up around um, City Hall in the foyer, and then we'll have a QR code on it there, and people can vote on which ones they think is the best, and it's prizes to be won. That's April 1st. April, well, that's when you submit your art, April 1st, and at the end of that month, then we'll choose prizes. April 12th, um, we're working with um, Vermont Housing Finance Agency um, to, um, to uh, help individuals educate them and sign them up for first-time home buyers. This is going to be in Winooski, and um, we're going to have um, free food and refreshments, and um, we're going to have bounce houses in the gym for the kids, and, and it's a lot of other um, service providers will be there to talk about, like uh, Human Rights Commission and, um, like, um, uh, who's going to be there? C, um, um, CVOEO and people who are going to talk about what is what is um you know um, the rights for fair for the first time home buyers. What's your right? What's your rights are? And so that's April twelfth. So that's going to be fun, free event. Come sign up if you if you're interested in um, wanting to own a place or have information about it. We're going to sign you right up. And it's also going to be like um, credit unions and mortgage companies, and these individuals will be there. April 27th, Art So Wonderful have a graffiti cleanup, and it's going to be awesome. It's called it's called Art So Wonderful um, Graffiti Sunset Cleanup, and it's from five to eight. And it's in the evening. It's going to be like an hour to clean up, and we'll have um, um, cleaning materials. That's going to be we're going to um, start kick it off at the Contours Auditorium in City Hall. And so we're going to kick this event off. We're going to give you our supplies. Our code enforcement officer, Bill Ward, will be there to train people, like tell you, this is how you wipe off graffiti and this, that, and other. And then afterwards, we're gonna have like a, a live entertainment. So you can stay there for, for um, um, the hear the DJ play, and we're gonna give you these cool swag bags from, um, from businesses around downtown Church Street Marketplace. So these things, there's a lot of things, you know, we're gonna, you'll, you'll see it on your social media, you'll see it on, uh, all around, you see our posters everywhere. So right now, my dear friend, uh, Lieutenant Governor um, David Zuckerman is here, and thank you, sir, for being being here today. Oh, glad uh, to be here. Always of good to see you. Absolutely. And um, and so you know, you've been on the show before, and um, the whole thing about it is that while we, I love to have you here because not uh, you're a busy person, and not many people get to hear about um, stuff you're working on, you know, um, and um, you know just. And so now this is a knowledge. You always come with knowledge for <laughs> our, um, our audience to learn about um, Vermont and what's happening here, you know, and, and what you're working on. And so we're going to start off. Well, um, I'm going to ask you, what do you think the state of Vermont is? I mean, I'm, that, that's a broad question, but, you know, the state of Vermont is, you know, you know, we, I guess, I don't know, what, you know, I, you know, as far as um, economics and uh, about, um, you know the things that we might be working on that um, that you be working on that make um, us um, successful as people in the state as well, in Vermont. Yeah, I mean, I think part of making Vermont successful is is what the state does mm -hmm. with policy. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, part of what makes Vermont successful is what people do uh, in their day to day lives, not only in their their business or work mm -hmm. situation. Um, but also how they work and volunteer in the community or help their neighbors. So, yeah. you know, I think in general, we're very fortunate. Uh, there's certainly a lot of challenges out there, don't get mm -hmm. me wrong, but people, when I think about Vermont compared to what I hear or see in other places, we still do a lot of community-minded mm -hmm. activities, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the, the topics you've been organizing around in April with Fair Housing Month, um, whether it's, you know, business folks are contributing their some of their business, either profits or products to mm -hmm. community events like you just talked about. Um, 
it's not universal by any means. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think sometimes there's a reliance on, on the goodwill of, of neighbors to sort of help us get through everything. But some of the things we have to get through are bigger than neighbors can necessarily do all their own. Uh, now they're dealing with climate issues and uh, you know the flooding of last year, mm. or if we're dealing with something like our housing crisis where mm. because of Vermont's politics relative to other states uh, and because of the climate crisis and because of how we handled COVID, mm. we're seeing a real influx of people, which is driving up housing prices, driving down housing availability. Mm. Some of these things are bigger than what a neighbor can solve. Right. You know, a neighbor can't suddenly come up with a house for people. Um, and so that's where the policymakers get involved. And whether that's adjusting policies so that it's easier or harder or different as to how to build housing or enough housing, or whether it's raising revenue to subsidize the housing so it's more affordable for working class people, or whether it's changing uh, Act 250, which is a, a term people hear about, but maybe they don't know what it is, but it's a, a land use and development law that was um, passed you know, 50 years ago uh, more than 50 years ago, to really prohibit or limit uh, unbridled development of our hillsides because it was right after the highways had been built and people were moving to Vermont from Massachusetts and New York and they were ready to build houses up and down the sides of the hills. Didn't matter about erosion, didn't <laughs> matter about septic and sewerage. Um, and so that, that law was passed to have us make sure when we develop housing, it's done in a way that, that is um, not destructive to what a lot of things we love about Vermont. Well, mm -hmm. that's one of the laws, as you talk about where Vermont is now, um, that's under review once again. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's designed uh, to limit development, but at the same time, it has made it sometimes where, in some places, housing should be, but it becomes more expensive because it's there uh, to build there. And there's been a number of studies done across the uh, across the state this last last summer and fall with groups from people that want to protect our environment and natural resources, both short-term and long-term, people who want to do development, people that are uh, you know, regulators of development to say, what are the aspects of this law that are you know, 50 years old that could be adjusted to encourage uh, sort of ecological and affordable housing in town and village centers without encouraging sprawl and environmental uh, sort of space uh, consumption. That's a big topic in Montpelier this year to, uh, to move towards being able to build more affordable housing. But the devil's always in the details and some of the parameters that people like myself are looking out for is if we make it easier to do development, are developers going to build affordable housing mm -hmm. or are they going to develop market priced housing, mm -hmm. which right now the market prices are way out of reach for most people. Mm. And so yeah. those are some of the parameters that we would still want to look at and say, right. if you can build more housing more densely, which will make it more cost effective to do it, but you only build high end housing that way, then you're not really helping the average Vermonter who's really struggling right now right. with housing. So that's a big piece. Yeah. So, it, so Act 250, that's all about just real, really real estate and development? Is that all about like real estate? Well, it's, or it's not just real estate. It's, it's commercial and industrial as well. Mm -hmm. But it's saying if you're going to pave over this big area to put up a big building for commerce and so forth, well, that whole area is not going to absorb water when it rains. Mm -hmm. Where does the water go? Well, the water's going to run off the parking lot and have to go somewhere. Well, as we you know, to uh, Joni Mitchell, pave paradise and put up a parking lot. Well, mm -hmm. if that happens in too many places or rivers are bermed up so that flood areas, that when it gets high, no longer flood because it's blocked off, that water goes downstream. Mm -hmm. And we see that um, in the floods we've had, whether it was Irene or now the flood of 23, uh, the more you develop areas, the less water is absorbed in the ground and the more it's got to go down the rivers and that floods our downtowns and village centers. So Act 250 is really, I think, trying to look at the, the bigger picture beyond the immediate moment. And yet at the immediate moment, we have a, a, a horrendous housing shortage. Mm -hmm. We oh, have to yeah. be thinking about nice. how do we rebuild right. in those areas that are flooded right. in a way that says, okay, we can still live there or we can still have business there, right. but how do we do it in a way that those mm -hmm. things aren't going to be costly when they get flooded again? Because right. We don't have the money to just keep, keep rebuilding everything. Same thing over and over, doing the um, same type of work so, over and yes. over. Yes. So Act 250, on the one hand, gets a big, big uh, mark 
on being prohibiting development. It doesn't actually prohibit development, but it makes it so that as a community we talk about these different elements of what's important when we do development. Now, I mean, this is way out the way, but how, like the signage on the highways, I mean, we don't have any. So is that part of Act 250? Like no, no You're talking about the billboards. The billboards, The yeah, billboards. The billboards yeah. uh, no, that was a separate law, but it was passed similar time. I don't remember which was first. I wasn't here then, and I just, my memory on the history isn't sharp. But um, no, the billboard laws were passed decades ago as another aspect, and, and they're related in terms of how we view our landscape. Right, sure. And, you know, I regularly hear from people when I'm at the farmer's market on Saturdays or uh, just around the state house when tourists come by, they go, God, you really know when you come into Vermont because <laughs> it just looks different. They sometimes don't even realize it's the lack of billboards. Sometimes when you tell them, they're like, that's it. Mm -hmm. But if you're in other states, you see all those billboards, and as soon as you come into Vermont, you see our mountains, and you right. see our you villages. Know, you awesome. see the steeples or the rooftops and the villages off the highway. I love it. I love people, it. people really recognize that. Well, I'll tell you, too, though, um, Lieutenant Governor, is that um, there's, there's no lights on highways mm -hmm. either. I mean, come on, bro. You know what I mean? Like, one minute you're driving on the same the land, you know, like on the road, the next you know, oh, the next side over the, over the highway, it's like a drop, like, uh, you know, Around well, the curve usually on the highways, so they've bad. got pretty good um, guardrails and stuff. Oh, yeah. Right? But most highways <laughs> got don't good have guardrails, lights give them that. Yeah, I mean, most highways don't have lights on them, but the, the main roads, yeah. you know, do in the village areas. It's dark but, out there but, on Vermont highways. Yeah, yeah. Dark. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know. I'm, so you I'm can the... see the sky. You know, there's a lot of people that, <laughs> see those, that see you know, the stars you, you, you see the stars or you see the moon. Uh, uh, that's something that yeah. a lot of people value. It tells you Me your too. direction. Yeah. It tells oh. you a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I love here. it. I love it, man. Yeah. I've been, I've been yeah. here since 89, so I, obviously I love, love the place. Right. You know, we both been at the same time. So I just thought I'd ask you that question. Now, so you talked a little bit about housing. Oh, so yeah. now, it's, now there's a crisis, I think, around the country, isn't it, about housing? Or just That's, sometimes we, we see the problems here in Vermont and think they're only here. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, for instance, law enforcement, public safety, and police nationwide there was a drop in people going into law enforcement mm -hmm. you know post George Floyd and, and so many others um, and that's that's a topic that is not only Vermont you know people quickly point fingers at uh, certain politicians or certain political leaders um, but the point is that public safety is an issue broader than purely law enforcement of breaking laws mm -hmm. you know uh, public safety is about housing. Public safety is about having decent paying jobs so people aren't stressed to meet their bills. Excuse me. Super Bowl last night, so yeah, it's up a little you. later than usual. Um, but, uh, but, you know, these issues are national. Housing is a national issue. Um, it's, it's more acute here because I've often said, so if, if New York City or Boston loses 10,000 people, say 10,000 people move out of either of those cities, out to rural you know, Vermont or off to Texas, wherever they go, mm -hmm. those cities don't even notice. It's like losing an eyelash, mm -hmm. right? Right. If 10,000 people move to Vermont, mm. it's a huge influx. Oh, no and doubt. suddenly the 1,000 homes that were for sale in Vermont have six buyers each, right? you no know, doubt. or 10 no buyers doubt. each. Oh, and how do Vermonters compete with folks who are selling yeah. properties yeah. down there that are two, three, five times the price? So housing is a huge issue. No doubt. Um, people may or may not know this, but Vermont is either, I think we're second in the nation in uh, second home ownership. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, again, have second homes. Mm -hmm. uh, two friends and I, you know, I always try to be transparent. Mm -hmm. We co-own a property in Roxbury. We're trying to fix it up and make it rentable yeah. and also for us to go to visit and vacation on the land. Mm -hmm. But um, but as but second homeowners, you know, I, I kind of have a philosophy. If you can afford a second home, you could pay more to make sure other people can afford it. No doubt home. about it. I guess, but I that's, that's going to be a big topic of discussion over some point because some folks say, no, no more taxes no matter what. And I, if I could take your time for two minutes to tell I'm you right a story. Here. I want to hear it. So, <clears throat> Uh, two summers ago, when I was running for this office again, Lieutenant Governor, I was at Thunder Road. It was probably, at that point, maybe late September, even October. And it's the Milk Bowl. And, uh, you know, four, five thousand, three thousand people there. 
and I'm walking through the crowd, and this guy goes, wait a minute, I know you. <laughs> I hear you on this radio show, and that's uh, WVMT with Kurt Wright and uh, oh, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, you know, I don't always agree with you, but um, at least you always say what you think. I said, fair enough. Well, he was wearing a Miami Dolphins shirt, so since we just had the Super Bowl last night, I'll bring this up. And I said, why would you have a Miami Dolphins shirt in New England? <laughs> We're either a Patriots fan for the most part, or you're a, a, a Giants fan from New York. But Miami Dolphins, like, that's sacrilege. Mm -hmm. And he started telling me about it. And the guy next to him came up and said, I want to know why my vanity license plate costs more and more money every year. Mm -hmm. And I said, here's the thing. It costs money to run government no matter what. You're either going to pay it through taxes, which can be more progressive. You could say, hey, wealthy people could pay a little more so working class people don't have to pay more and more when they're struggling to pay their bills, mm -hmm. or through fees. And because people keep electing folks that say no taxes, no taxes, no taxes, yeah. the fees go up. So that license plate fee right, right, go or up. your fishing license or your hunting license, those go up. Mm -hmm. And I said, you got to pay for state employees to do this work. Mm -hmm. And the first guy says, well, we know that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's because dumb bleeps like you mm -hmm. keep voting for these people <laughs> that say no taxes when people like me want to see Right. Us reverse some of those 40 years of Reaganomic sure. trickle-down tax cuts for the rich, reversed. And, uh, and they all laughed. You know, the reality, and, and they were chummy about their laughter, and they enjoyed that I was straightforward and I right. swore and whatever. Sure. Right. But the point is that we have to talk about resources, right. taxes. Mm -hmm. Often the word resources is used as a, oh. as a euphemism for money and taxes. Sure. As a society, rich people used to pay when America was great, when make America great time was, whenever that was, maybe the 50s or 60s, the top income people in America paid 70, 80, 90% of those top dollars in taxes. That paid to build our roads. That paid to build, invest in affordable housing. That paid for the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. That paid for a lot of things that made it so everyday working people could survive better in society. And ever since the early 80s when Reagan passed those bills, and then since then with neoliberals, sometimes Democrats as well, passed laws to lower the taxes on wealthier people, are we better off today or are we worse off? Mm -hmm. I think more people are struggling today. I think of housing is less affordable today. I think educational opportunities and, and are, are fewer for a lot of people today than they used to be. Mm -hmm. and, and we're paying for those challenges out there on the street. So. Um, so housing is an issue that's going to take a time to solve because we've taken a lot of years to get into this problem. But again, back to the second homeowners, Vermont has the second most second homes in the country. I believe it's something like 16% of our housing units are second homes. That's a lot. We have, I mean, it seems like a lot. It's a ton. And we have a lot of people that can't afford homes. The two is a clear blend. So I think those of us with second homes can pay more in taxes to make sure we could build more housing for everyday people to have houses. Yeah. So, well, you know, homeless people, right? You know, uh, what about yeah. that issue? It's like, um, like I think the city, like you know, homeless people, like the city of Bronson, put up those, you know, I'm gonna call them shelters. I hate to call them pod because some heard people use the word pod people. Hmm. That's, that's pitiful to say hmm. that. Thirty-five um, shelter units, in, um in Bronson, and. Um, and so that that's something, but you know, um, I you know really you know it's, it's kind of like a band aid, but I guess it would does get people out the cold. And I think the stay is supposed to be like six months or something at the maximum, mm -hmm. and then and then for you to go on to find something relevant to your housing. So, but there is no you know I don't see where they're gonna go without no housing. Well, I mean, we we are clearly uh, many thousands of housing units short. Um, you know, we have a lot of long-term rentals being turned into short-term rentals because they can make more money. Uh, like I said, people are moving in. Um, fewer people are living in certain houses. We have to do a combination of things. We need short-term uh, housing. We have to get people housed. So whether it's the pods or whatever you want to call them, uh, whether it's congregate housing, whether it's the motel vouchers, uh, the Senate mm -hmm. just uh, put more money into the Budget Adjustment Act on Friday. So the House and Senate are going to work out their differences. But that money is supposed to help people stay in those motels for, the, for three months from uh, April 1st to uh, June 30th mm. um, to get us to the next budget cycle. We know 
we know that when people have a, a house or a shelter or a place that's reasonable to go back to every night where they can clean up, where they can change their clothes to clean clothes and can go get a job, that is a foundational basis of stability that lets people get back on their feet. But we also know that congregate housing or pods or different things like or these hotel rooms, those are temporary. That's not truly stable housing. Mm -hmm. It's far more stable than living out on the street or living in a tent or, you know, under tree boughs with, with blankets and a, and a tarp on you. Um, but we also know that there's a range of things that people need. They need stable housing. But if you've been on the edge of financial distress for a long time or if you've been living on the street for a long time, there's probably mental health from the stress of all that. Out. There's quite possibly <laughs> substance use disorder, um, you know, whether it's the opioid crazy tragedy situation that's going on right now or um, or other drugs, alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to we we need a, we need a huge invention intervention uh, to help people get back on their feet. And some folks talk about using public safety, which also means law enforcement in some right. aspects of it, to just put people into locked facilities. Right. That costs even more money mm -hmm. than temporary housing right. does or these other services and doesn't help people get back on their feet. Um, so. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> there was a time. Well, you, you wanna, yeah, no, no, you're good. Um, like, you know, a lot of across the country, not just not just Vermont, you know, defund the police. Right. Defund. And they did. Well, they, 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 took, they, they didn't. Had a, they, they, <laughs> they had an issue around um, school resource officers. They had to go yeah. back out on patrol. But usually they didn't. So what, what you, what's your sense? My understanding of the vote was to um, not defund law enforcement, but to, as and it didn't happen the way they intended. I'll, that's completely true. But was as law enforcement officers left the force, the idea was don't replace them with another law enforcement officer. Replace them with a social worker or right. a mental health counselor yeah. or other supports so that the crimes of poverty would be addressed through a different means than purely arresting more people and putting them in jail. Now, it didn't go the way it was planned for a number of different reasons. One is a lot of members of the force left all at once instead of over yeah. time, hmm. you know, one or two people leaving every, you know, three to six months and you replace them with you someone else. You know, and so you don't, you don't like have that. this collapse all of a sudden. So the collapse happened, um, but also uh, the administration either couldn't find or didn't look hard enough or I don't know what mm -hmm. to fill those positions with these other types of service sure. providers. Um, but it, it was actually never about defunding. It was reallocating. Mm -hmm. um, but sure, those words were used in Vermont. They were used all over the country. I don't think they were actually productive words right, no, in the so world of sort of worse. social we, discussion we around police, political process. People want surface. people want safe streets. Yeah. People don't want to walk around yeah. being uh, yeah, heckled I think, uh, or harassed. Bro, I, I'm not sure, but I think Rome police got down like 70 some officers or something, and they always already were short. You know, what I mean, they always wanted over 100. I sit on Vermont State Police Fair and Partial Police in the Community you know, Advisory, and they they still want 100 more troopers right now. I'm like 100 troopers. Right. Wow, that's a lot, you know. To me, that's a lot. Seems like a lot. I mean, I think Vermont is an aggregate. Someone told me the other day, I don't, I don't know this is an accurate statistic, but somewhere across Vermont in total, municipal and state, mm -hmm. uh, we lost many hundreds of law enforcement at that same time. Oh, so it wasn't just the vote of mm -hmm. the Burlington City Council right. that did it. It was the national sentiment about whether law enforcement was um, looking the other way when certain law enforcement officers were uh, not treating each and every citizen with the same dignity and respect. You know, uh, like I said, it was, it was on the heels of George Floyd, but you had Breonna Taylor. I mean, you had, we could list a hundred names, yeah, Trayvon sure. Martin, yep. uh, hundred names a year, thousand names a year. Um, and so the, the public's trust and confidence was broken. I think there's a real effort on the part of law enforcement. I think there's a real effort on the part of the public to say public safety is a combination of law enforcement, housing, social workers, mental health workers to say 
the broader issue of public safety is more than just about crime. And, um, and we have to rebuild trust for our law enforcement officers, and we have to train them in implicit biases <laughs> so that mm. we, we tackle these topics in a community way that we need to. Yeah, so it's like, um, yeah, like, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, it means a lot of things, you know what I mean? Um, but I know um, one thing for sure that like um, we we uh, was part of this board of online a uh, common alliance with mm. you might, with all the different chiefs around, and uh, we wanted to figure out that was years ago. Figure out how we can make things better between the relationships with, with the people, BIPOC, P POC people. You know what I'm saying? And um, and um, and so one thing we came up with was the data collection. Whereas that, um, you know, you probably know Stephanie Seguino. Absolutely. You know, you know and um, we this came up with this. She was on a part of that, our group. And uh, she did a lot of, she did the findings, the statistical. And we found out, like, um, as far as African Americans, like, um, um, the Vermont State Police, like, 85% of people, they stop with people who look like me. Right. Same with the Burlington Police. I mean, come on, man. We only, like, two, well, at that time, we probably, like, 1%, 1.0% of people who lived here. Certainly so more than 80%. Work? Huh? Certainly weren't 80% of the population. No. <laughs> well, can you? Why? Yeah. So it was like, like when people say driving while black, it's that's like, right. yo, bro, that's for real, for real. Yes, it is. You know? And well, so, those are the concerns that, um, that I think were unheard for a long time <laughs> by the broader public and by politicians and elected officials. And again, it took the tragedies coming to yeah, light, right. partly because of cell phones that we have here, capturing it on film, that you know, why were people being treated the way they were for the relative scale of crime that they were oh um, God, alleged to have please, done. Man. And as you pointed out, even the maybe the non-crime of simply driving while black, but then being profiled or mm -hmm. someone being concerned, well, if you're if you're black and you're driving up 89 or 91 mm -hmm. or, or, you know, whatnot, then you, you are probably someone who's bringing drugs to sell in Vermont probably, yeah, to then yes, buy guns think. and bring back to New York. Right. Well, that certainly does happen. No but doubt. it is it is a fraction, a, a very small fraction of the black or the white people that are driving north. So these are the kinds of things where um, we, we have to be looking at these statistics and say there's a reason why some of the trust has been broken. Mm. On the other hand, um, we also have to look at why are so many people buying those drugs? Because if we if we there's some that say, well, just keep arresting the people bringing the drugs. Well, guess what? You arrest one, there's five more driving Man, up right behind them. It's a, it's because a, there's money to be made. It is right. actually, it, it, is, it is capitalism. Yeah, right? oh my God. There's money to be made, and they are selling a product because there's demand. If that's not the definition of capitalism, I don't know what is. So we need to work in our communities on after-school programs. We need to work in our communities on um, support programs for people who have substance use disorder and help them wean themselves off. We need to reduce that demand and get people back on their feet. We have 16,000 unfilled jobs in Vermont. We need to make sure they're paying well enough. I would argue universal health care would help all our small businesses compete with bigger businesses for those, those potential employees for jobs because most of us in small business can't offer health, health insurance. Um, so some sort of universal, at least primary care, if not broader. Um, we are going to keep having the problems we have if we keep trying to do the same thing yep. over and over again. But we cannot treat people differently solely because of what they look like or who they love or whatnot. And you know, that's something that's, that's happening more and more or, or seeming to happen more and more. And, um, and we need to break that down and move back to the idea of each person as an individual. Yeah, so it's like, you know, it's tough, man, because like, you know, People who look at Vermont, you know, who we are, we're, you know, we're, we're, first of all, we're like one of the most expensive states to live in. Yeah. And also, um, you know, but we're beautiful with the green, the green mountains and the lakes, you know. And, um, yeah, it's almost a trade-off. Yeah. We're partly as beautiful as we are because we've restricted where stuff can happen, right. but restricting where stuff has happened makes stuff more expensive. Right. But they leave out the part, you know, drugs, uh, it, it, man, it's like, it's like any large, large city. Now, we're like, we're not, oh, it's, don't think there's no drugs being served. Right. Don't think people are not getting shot right downtown in the park. Right. In one, you know, in our city hall parks all the time. All the time these things are happening. Well, they're not shot all the time. Shot. 
I they're mean, not shot all the time. Okay, there are not. people who are shot, and okay. it's too frequent. Okay. But all we right. have to be careful about the words we use because okay. right. all the time would mean like right now, every day. Okay. Now. No, you won't look at it like they, that. Okay. I, well, I, I, working in the public official sphere, um, <laughs> the words you I don't use care it. whether it's being right. left or right or somewhere else. If we, yeah. it is so easy, and I don't fault you for this. I do it too. If we rhetorically start to, right. to say things beyond where the right. facts sure. are, sure. then it distorts things. Yeah. I mean, that's what our former yeah. president well, does every well, single day. Well, you know, day. I guess, I guess. And you're I, not our former president. No, no, don't no, get me wrong. I'm no, not No, no, I get that. it. But I, I guess I, I should have used the words differently. But, uh, but, but people you know, get being shot. Living it is Vermont, possible being, to be shot being, any day. Being living in Vermont since 1989, I've seen the tr change, yep. the incredible, gigantic change, whether it be in um, us building new places, um, you know, ec economics, you know, but it also in crime, yeah, crime. Is, is the risk is higher. It's more, um, it is. It's more um, high risk in a, lot, in a lot of ways. Well, when you come down to, like, um, homicides, I mean, I mean, okay, not every day, but I'm just trying to say, but look, that number yeah, has went yeah. up a lot. Hom homicides have gone up, but if you look at national trends and you look at Vermont trends from 1990, mm -hmm. which I actually did in my last Lieutenant Governor newsletter, um, we are actually lower than 1989 and 90. Well, oh, what really? happened was it went down for like 30 straight years, and then the last couple of years, it's gone up. Mm -hmm. And so our memory is that it's higher now, and it definitely is higher now than at our lowest just before the pandemic. But overall crime is down from the late 80s and the 90s. Well, thank you. Um, for, for but it doesn't me. matter what the statistics say. Mm -hmm. If we feel, and you feel it, you're like, it's higher, it's worse. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. If that's what we feel, mm -hmm. then that's the reality we're in. And, um, and so partly, you know, if someone goes downtown and they don't feel safe, then, then what we're doing is not working. Now, whether they don't feel safe because uh, there's panhandlers and there's needles, mm -hmm. whether they don't feel safe because they're afraid they're going to get shot, all of those things, if you don't feel safe and people are going to stop coming into Burlington because of that, that's bad for people uh, who have kids in the schools because we're starving fewer kids. That's bad for our businesses downtown because people are going to stop coming downtown to, to shop. That's bad for, you know, housing. So... The facts do say one thing, um, and how we feel mm -hmm. really matters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't feel safe right. uh, across the social and racial spectrum. But we still have to recognize that people of color, black and brown folk, uh, still feel disproportionately mm -hmm. and actually are disproportionately uh, apprehended or um, intersected with law enforcement. And... We have to figure out how to address that because nobody should feel unsafe, either from what's going on on the streets mm -hmm. or what's happening from public mm -hmm. safety. Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> so I agree, and thank you for you know, giving me the facts. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot, you know, um, since all these tragedies with you know, Trevon and a lot of other individuals, uh, African Americans who you know, perish under, under, under the law enforcement uh, hands. Um, so things change, right? Like the Black Lives Matter change. Uh, people uh, start hiring diversity, equity, and uh, jet, justice, equity, yeah. and diversity, and inclusion, yeah. yep. and diversity, DEI, DEI and um, you know, coordinators. You know, our racial e equity, inclusion, and belonging coordinators. And so, um, you know, for me, I think that's a good thing. You know, but but it's also don't bring people. It don't. It don't. It don't bring. You know. When when you start hearing equity, the word equity, you might have heard it all your life, but oh, I never heard it. Start hearing it. I don't hear the word equity never coming up or nothing. Never right, hear. It. Right. So you know, until this start happening, everybody wants to say equity. Right. And equity. Mean, I don't know. We, what does equity mean to you? You know. Um, well, I mean that there yeah. there's there's equity and opportunity, mm -hmm. and then there's equity in what you have, and there isn't fully equity in either of those places. Mm -hmm. Right. We know that wealth accumulation that in this moment in time, mm. the average white person in our country has an asset value, whether it's uh, partly owning a home or things that you own or bank accounts or stocks. Mm. Um, the average white person has, I think it's about $120,000 or $130,000 in wealth. The average person of color has around 18 or 20,000. So that's not equitable. 
And that's due to the things that some people say, you can never talk about these things. Yes, you can. Our systems, aka systemic racism, has occurred from redlining to uh, unequal application of the GI Bill for people who served in our military, served our country through wars, mm. then did not get the same GI Bill opportunities if they were a person of color, black or brown, versus if they were white. Well, those opportunities of education, those opportunities to buy property, which is a way to accumulate wealth, has led us to the inequities of today. Um, and so that's one form of inequity. And we have to think about, okay, what do we do over time? But we also have to recognize that not everybody who is white has the same equity. Um, I was lucky enough to come out of college without debt. My dad was a doctor. Uh, we were better off. I was, he, had, he had passed away by the time I went to college, but they had set aside resources for me to go to college. Uh, my mom helped me with a down payment on a house in Burlington back in 1994 that I bought for $115,000. I own that house today with no debt, this duplex. It's worth more than $120,000, I can guarantee you that. Oh, no, it is. So does that because I'm some brilliant person? <laughs> no, I had good fortune to come out of school without debt and have a little bit of help for a $15,000 down payment. Not everybody has that. Most people don't. But also most white people don't either. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of working class white people who come out of high school, also don't go to college, don't have high paying jobs, and they're struggling too. So equity is an economic measure that if you just do I averages, makes, makes it look pretty bad, and it is pretty bad, but it doesn't really describe the variation within each group. Mm -hmm. The other equity is equity and opportunity. And that's why, to me, investing in public schools is so important. It's saying, no matter what your background, there is a school that door open to you, and you have an opportunity to learn. You have an opportunity to learn to, learn to read. You have the opportunity, hopefully in most schools, to do basic industrial arts. You have the opportunity to learn science, social studies. Um, and those opportunities, we need to continue to, to fund and create so that our young kids feel like they have the potential at a better future. And one aspect of that is seeing more people like themselves in the books, in positions of leadership, business or governance. And you know, slowly we do have that in some cases, in other cases we still don't. Um, but equity, there's equity in what you have and there's equity in the opportunity of what you can get. Mm. And in neither case do we have equity yet. Um, but I would say in a, in a just and civil society, we need to keep working towards that. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. No, no. So everybody's saying, because I sit on all these anti-racism thing, commissioner, yeah. human rights commissioner and all that, I, I, that I am. Um, and people are saying, using that word equity, um, that everybody should have equity and um, equity, equity, equity. And it's an incredible buzzword, you know, for me, how I see it. Yeah, because, um, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well... I think you said it more eloquently than I can, just like I would try to say it, but you said you said I think real good. I think equity, what it means to me is like um, um, it's giving an individual the same opportunities. Like, you know, a lot of, for instance, here goes a lot of this hypothetical. Well, here goes, um, well, like, for instance, like a lot of the information, like I, I work with, uh, like, uh, like I'm on North Street all the time talking to people I know. I used to live on North Street. Um, and like on King Street area and in Rutland, like Baxter Street, and I got my own house there. Um, people, and that's kind of economically, it used to be on you know, economic challenge, high risk environment, right? Mm -hmm. and nobody gets the information about nothing, about housing or jobs or, you know, in that neighborhood, not posted nowhere. That's right. But you go on to the better parts of the neighborhood, like say the South End of Burlington, for instance, do you find you get all this information about? These individuals, um, residents, get the information, the good stuff. Right. Why don't, why, I think equity is like getting everybody the information that, that everybody should get, you know. Right. And another thing, too, is like, um, and, and, and this is a fact, it's not nothing, it's true. It's like if you, you can live in an owner family, beautiful and diverse, and that, you know, as it is, and live there in a place, um, you're going to pay the same amount there than if you was living in the south, the south end of Burlington. And, and the people, it just so happened, the, the places in, in the um, Old North Fair, for instance, a lot of them are like kind of like blighted. They're not up, to, they're up probably, probably the only thing about them is up to cold, I mean, to some extent. But they're not looking like the south end of places. And they people who 
like might refer them to to the houses in South. Don't even think about referring them to South End places. You know, these not, not people of color, they don't even, they send them right to the North, their own North End sure. or, or high risk in areas. Well, or and like there's, a, there's a places. couple of reasons for that. I mean, the, the, the prices are different. They aren't the same. Um, and people who are in. Was, I mean, if you was to rent a, 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 like a two bedroom, yep. you saying it's, they're not the same? They, uh, they, well, I, I know. I the, mean, not that, to buy a place, but I'm saying. Okay, like, well, to buy a place, the prices are different. Diff definitely. Cause, um, yeah, to rent, tax I don't currently are. know. Oh, I know um, that for a fact. I mean, well, I believe you then. Uh, I rent a property, the one I was talking about earlier, in the old North End, and I rent it for about two thirds or three quarters of market rate. But that's, I also own it outright and right. don't feel like it's fair to have prices the way they are right, right. now. Sure. I mean, a lot of people talk about, a lot of landlords say, well, if property taxes go up, we just have to raise. Raise rents to make up for that. And, and they're, they're way above the price they paid for those properties in a lot of instances. Mm -hmm. If they've owned those properties for 10 or 20 years, they are making good money. Mm -hmm. And if the property taxes go up by a couple hundred or even a thousand bucks, they're still going to make good money on that property without bumping it up. But, um, but I think there are biases. You know, we talked, I talked about earlier with law enforcement. We all have them. Uh, every single one of us. I've got biases. There's biases we don't even know we have. Right. Um, yeah. You've got all, them. We all have and, biases. And what happens with, if we don't concentrate on learning about why do we react a certain way to certain people, or do we have an inherent thought that, well, if I saw, you know, a black person um, looking to rent a property, if, if I'm assuming the old North End is less expensive because it's a little bit, you know, more run down, and I'm going to assume, and I'm, I'm being... Hypothetical and theoretical. Yeah, here. Sure, I'm not sure, trying sure. to say I think no, no, this, sure, sure. but um, <clears throat> think this person might not make as much money, or they might not have as much money for a down payment, even on a on an apartment. You got to put a first month or sometimes last month rent. Um, you're going to direct them where you think the rents are less expensive, and yeah. so then you start yeah. doing that, yeah. and, and we and we just continue to concentrate the problem of treating people differently, and then people being by de facto quasi redlined into certain areas of the town. True. Um, and that's a problem. That's part, that's no part of it. But you know, to Lieutenant Governor, I think that they are um, putting people who looks like them in the same, in like in the same right. melting pot. Now, yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, mostly. they say this is where people like you are, so we'll put you yeah. over there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do think there's, a, there's an effort by many not to do that, but, um, but also prices and... Um, I do think the prices are lower in the old North End on average than they are down in the South End because you have denser property. You've got, um, so you've got more units uh, per space. Um, I, again, I could, I could certainly be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm not talking about buying a place. I'm talking about this. Reason, renting. But, you, but um, you know, well, anyways, I, no, no, no. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. It's this not, is this is the this is the discrimination. So that's that's that part of the about equity part of it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so there, there's no equity in that. Well, if you know, if if you got the same units in not the same units, but you have units in the south end, like you do at the old north end. You know what I mean? That um, that um, two bedrooms. They should be around. They sh it may, if they're the same rate price, they should look elegant, like like the South End places. Well, and that's who owns the property and how they're maintaining it. But also from an equity perspective, if you're in the South End, the number of people per park or open space is far fewer because it's not as dense. It's not as dense and yeah. so you don't have equity to the basketball court. You don't have equity with respect to trails to walk on. Um, or if you don't know about them, like a lot of the old North End is right next to the Intervale. But to get there, you got to go way over down Riverside Ave and back down in. You can't sure. just go down the hill. Sure. And so it doesn't seem like it's an accessible space. Um, so there's, there are so many forms of inequity, and they're often race-based, they're often class-based, um, and the combination, because of historical systems, is, is obviously very disparate. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the things that as a society we need to figure out, do we want to continue doing that or not? Mm -hmm. And the conversations that are happening today are those very difficult conversations where folks who have benefited from the past um, and who have a particularly large amount of resources, and partly they've worked hard to get them, there's no doubt, no doubt. but they've also had hidden benefits to themselves. They may be blind to them. Um, to say, do you need as much as you have? 
when we have people that are hungry or we have people in inadequate housing, whether it's unhoused or whether it's folks renting and not getting the quality of housing they deserve, that's the that's the societal debate mm -hmm. at all times, you know, and so we're pushing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, another thing, too, is like um, since we're talking about housing a little bit, I'm just going to say this and um, like the shelters on Elmwood Street in Bronx, you know, 35 shelters. Um, like in, I'm from Chicago, so like you know the projects are right, right in the economic challenge kind of. If you would think of it, high risk areas, the projects and probably right. most in the most uh, um, metropolitan cities, you know, areas, you know. Right. Um, and same with Bronson. Now they started those pods right at the old North End. Yeah. I mean, old North End is not economic really. Uh, I remember when it was, but now. But it's still high, kind of high risk, and you still find blighted, blighted places, and and it's still, um, you know. Um, and it's got a reputation, whether reputation, it or not. Right. Yep. And and so, but still, they built those, they, they put those places in the, right at the start of Old North End, and they put them like somewhere, you know, like right. something somewhere else. Place. Well, and this is nice a, there's a combination of challenges there. One is you've got neighborhoods that say, "I'd rather not have that here," right? Uh, the the NIMBY factor. Um, which is, is an element of fear, again, whether justified or not, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but, but the fear, fear is a real driver. Mm -hmm. Fear is what drives folks that, that Trump elevates. Fear is what drives people um, who are fairly liberal and with resources say, well, I want to support that, but not in my backyard. <laughs> it's still based on fear. Sure, I get, um, it. I get it. And the other side of it is the services that many of those folks need um, uh, social workers who can help find more housing, social workers that can help with the governmental policies that get those folks the resources they need to, to start putting their shoes back on their feet and get back, back up on their feet, uh, resources around substance use disorder. Those tend to be closer to downtown. And so you want this place where you're sheltering people to be within walking distance and closer to the place where the services are that they need. So it's a combination of... That's a good answer uh, it's to a, the governor, you know, but, um, you know... It doesn't mean I it's right. I, I, it doesn't I mean it's good. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know that it's I mean, a good I mean, it's answer. A, it's a good I'm answer based on why that happens. Well, it sure doesn't mean it's a say, good that's thing. I think that's uh, what, what um, a lot of people who know, um, who necessarily didn't have me in a room or someone who looked like me in a room will say. I, know, no, absolutely. I don't, I, don't say, I don't think that it's a good thing that that's why it happened. Mm -hmm. I'm explaining why it happens. Okay. I'm being the messenger to say, this is why the decision makers choose to do it there. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a good thing yeah. that it only happens there. there. There are a lot of places this could happen. We have a lot of open space or parks or places where such pods or, or housing, temporary housing, could be located near... Um, a, a near a park or in a park and uh, near a bus stop so that people could take the bus to those services. Yes, sir. But, but I said it's a combination of factors. There is that not in my backyard factor yeah, as yeah, well sure. because of that fear. Yes. Fear can be justified. Mm -hmm. Fear can be not justified. Yeah. It still exists. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these factors come into play as to why that happens. Mm -hmm. And it's a shortage of resources. You know, again, I'll go back to Reaganomics and the fact that we have been squeezing everyday people harder and harder for 40 years. We've been moving good paying jobs overseas for 40 years. Doesn't matter whether it was Republican presidents or Democratic presidents, you know, whether it's NAFTA under Clinton or other free trade under different administrations, we've moved a lot of decent middle class jobs sure. out of our neighborhoods, out of our, out of our state and um, out of the country, from all over the country. And now people come out of high school and they can't make a good living wage. All of these factors from that, that squeeze of Reaganomic trickle-down mm -hmm. tax garbage has left us with not enough housing, has left us without the education system, has left us without the social services to get these people back on their feet, whether it's in the old North End or whether we do it in the South End or whether we do it in Shelburne or we do it in Underhill or Williston. Um, this is a community conversation that we have to address that these are our neighbors. Mm -hmm. These are our kids or our friends' kids. These are people that are part of our community, and we need to work with them with respect and with the full range of services 
to get help them get back on their feet. So, you know, we have a little time left, but I want to talk about the state of the world, man. <laughs> you know, yeah, I was from one oh, frustrating God. and hard topic to oh, another. Well, you know, I just, fair, you know, I just, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's based on, you know, I can I can really give an opinion about a person who we've been like stereotype or you know, slavery. And, but when you talk, when you, I can't give no really no opinions about two different types of ethnicities and diversities that mm -hmm. that um while they feel the way they feel about each other, yeah. you know, unless unless, unless, unless they say it, because they say it because they live it and that's who they are and that's 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 what happens, you know. But so it's I, you know I just I just wish that you know like you know can we all get along you know kind of deal you know it's just like how are we gonna straighten out this it's some and I know you yeah I don't know some some ways I don't know, can't even find the words that Lieutenant Governor right you know it's, you know and I mean, it's tough I, man I I don't have all the answers to the world <laughs> you know there are sage people like uh, Dalai Lama and Mandela and uh, Vandana Shiva and others who. <laughs> who are just incredible thinkers and minds, and we've, of course, got plenty in our own country, too. I'm just not naming them all, um, nor remembering them all, because there's more people that are wise than we could ever name. Right, sure. But mm. fundamentally, uh, a lot comes down to the basic needs that we all have. Food, shelter, mm. housing, uh, I guess that's shelter, uh, community, a sense of... of belonging, a sense of, of reason for existing, which sometimes is answered through religion, mm -hmm. sometimes is answered through work, sometimes is answered through family. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, we have, as humans, in the last couple centuries, uh, moved to a level of, of um, feeling satisfied through consumption, right? It's just more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. Well, as we use more stuff, mm -hmm. that comes from somewhere. And we are competing mm -hmm. for that, those natural resources all over the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the most fundamental needs are, of course, clean water, mm -hmm. food, shelter. But when I look at the challenges around the world, if you look at the root causes of the strife that exists, mm -hmm. it's typically those things. And they're then hidden behind veils of religion or hidden behind veils of well, you know, like in Russia and Ukraine, well, that was once part of our country and now it's part of another country. Well, over centuries and millennia, boundaries of societies have moved all over the world, including indigenous cultures and populations in, our, in this mm -hmm. land, um, where different indigenous peoples fought with each other over those basic resources. And the question is, can we, as as complex thinking individuals come up with a better system. Um, one where we solve our problems without, you know, bullets and death mm -hmm. or bombs and annihilation or revenge, like we're, you know, we're seeing, it's maybe used under different terms, but it's revenge uh, in Israel and Gaza where there is just right. unheard of destruction, mm -hmm. where the dominant power is just annihilating you know, tens of thousands of Palestinians um, <sighs> for the actions of October 7th. But it's it's but those and other actions are from earlier than that, whether it's settlement right. patterns, whether saying. it's back in 1947, that's whether it's before about. 1947. And until we see each other, whether it's a homeless person on the street of Burlington or someone in Gaza or someone in Ukraine or Russia, until we see people as dignified individual human beings that we respect, if we continue to, uh, or, or rural, rural people, whether it's Vermont or American, we go those MAGA people. If we don't find a way to say that is a human being and they are, they are hurting or in pain and they are lashing out for, for one reason or another, then we will continue to be pointing fingers at each other and, and therefore feeling like we can cause people harm because we dehumanize them. Mm -hmm. And we have to move away from that mindset. And we as society as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't have the magic bullet on how to do that other than for each of us to do it as an individual in our daily lives. And, um, you know, uh, it's, we can do that individually. But like we said early on, and I suspect we're wrapping up here shortly, yeah. you know, when a flood happens, we can all pitch in a little bit. But unless we pitch in beyond the affected communities and all help pay for rebuilding roads and culverts or businesses and houses. You can't do it just with 
local altruism. Mm. It's, it's the bigger form of government coming together from areas outside the devastated area to help each other. And um, so we have to do both. We have to individually treat people with dignity and respect, and we have to collectively put resources together to create educational opportunities, build affordable housing, make sure people have the basic needs um, that they have and need in order for them to be helpful and productive members of society for others who have needs. And uh, that to me is the combination of individualism and collective action through governance uh, or community service. And um, so maybe that's the positive note to end on is I think we can do that, um, but it's gonna take everybody looking in inside themselves to do it. Well, Lieutenant Governor, thank you for that incredible uh, answer, which is a good answer. I, mean, I don't know. I think you, you <laughs> the thought, world it, is it, tough. It man. looked like you thought about it. Well, I think about it these things like, all like the time. Okay. But yeah, fair so, enough. So now I have to ask you one of the questions: What did you do with that long ponytail? <laughs> <laughs> did you did you give it away? What you do? You, yeah, got, it on, you well, got it in a frame? Well, no, no, like no it's not, not in a frame. <laughs> it's been different lengths. I've donated it at times to kids with alopecia and kids that mm -hmm. have other cancers that need hair and sure. wigs. Sure. Uh, we have fundraised sometimes for organizations, in fact, King Street Youth Center and others. Sure. Back in yeah. 2006 or seven, I shaved my head and oh, donated wow. money to four or five different youth programs around the state. This time it was uh, an uh, election fundraiser a year and a half ago. Oh. I said, donate to keep or donate to cut. Oh. And cut gave more money, so I yeah. cut it off. Now, uh, like many, it's getting a little bit thinner. So I don't know that it's going to be coming back again. I it might know. be gone for good. I don't um, know. I but don't know. Uh, yeah. but yeah, no, it's wow. We I mean, never, it's, we didn't it's save same, it for us. It's yeah. the same. You know, it's like it just seemed weird. I mean, you know, I've known you for I don't know twenty yeah. years, or whatever. 30, 30 it's, years, yeah, thirty years, and it just seemed weird that um, I don't see it. You know what I mean? Because I know it's, it's like down, way, way down here. <laughs> Yeah, it was as so, low as my belt of, at one time. I know, but, it, was, it was weird. But, but nope. so, okay, so last night, last you night. were hanging out with the, on the football, Super Bowl, yeah. and your team was, who would you go with? I didn't really care. I'm a Patriots a fan. Patriot. I, I'm, I'm, I rooted I'm, a little bit more for Kansas City because my daughter was excited about Kansas City because of Taylor Swift Kansas and Kelsey City. and all that stuff. And also to uh, stick a finger at some of the strange crazy conspiracy yeah. stuff politically that was going on around it. Yeah. But uh, my brother lives in San Francisco, and, mm -hmm. and Purdy certainly reminds me of that sort of low pick that did well, kind of like Brady, but he was way uh, at the end of the pick. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted good football. And yeah, you know, there were some sense. bad plays in there, but overall yeah. it was a good close football wow. game. It was a lot of fun well, to watch. I mean, you know, I was like third quarter, man. I'm thinking it was like 10 to <clears> 6 or something. I was yeah. 10 to, and 10 I was like, 10. yeah, 13. Yeah, yeah. It's, Oh yeah, and so I was wondering. Like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't know if a chief gonna. Be, I didn't. I really don't care because I'm a you know I'm a Patriots fan because I live in Vermont, but I'm also a Bears fan. Sure you are. You know, who, who, they, and the Bears crushed my Patriots yeah. back in 1986 yeah. Yeah, I remember. with Refrigerator was, Perry, 46-10. Oh, that, that was so. So nice. that's when I was a teenager, that, that and that was nice. That hurt to the soul. Know, it was not yard, nice. <laughs> one yard line or something. I remember that. Yeah, he ran he, that ball. He was like 318 pounds. Or something. Oh, he was huge. I think it was even more than that. Man, that guy, Refrigerator Perry. <laughs> I don't know where he is today, but... Number 72, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Lieutenant Governor, do you have any last words you want to say? Um, on, on uh, you this? know, it's always a pleasure to come on. Yes, sir. Uh, I know that I talk too long and no, too much. No, man, you give a lot of good but information. But I hope folks full, take the full full scope of what I'm saying and, and also can always reach out. Uh, the yeah. website's right there, ltgov.vermont.gov, uh, and there's a info. You can send an email, and we'll get back to you on... You know, if you say, Dave, you're FOS and here's why, mm -hmm. I'll read it. Yeah. I'll listen. I'll sure. at least respond that I got it um, and maybe offer some statistics. Yeah. Uh, or you could say, oh, you're spot on. Or you could say, I hope you'll take on this issue, yeah. whatever this issue is. You know, I, one thing I want to encourage everybody to do is reach out to your legislators. You know, Vermont is a small enough scale. You can call your legislator. You can call your your congressional delegation. You might not hear back from them directly, but your, your House and Senate person in Vermont will probably get back to you directly. You can find out who they are through the legislative website, uh, leg.state.vt.us. Uh, so that's short for legislature, leg, period, state, the full word, dot vt, dot us. And you can look up your legislator based on your address and or your town, and you can call them up and leave them a message. Mm. And um, it's a human scale here in Vermont. And your story, your experience, your wishes are, are valuable because they have no staff. 
And so whatever you're an expert in, um, your life experiences, your professional experiences, your academic experiences, uh, your reality is information that can help them make better decisions. Mm. It can help me. So reach out to the website, um, mine or theirs, and uh, that's, that's what I would leave it with. Whoa, 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 you can make you. an impact. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you very much, Lieutenant Governor. Absolutely. And once again, thank you for coming on to the Straight Talk with Macho. Absolute Always pleasure. good to see you, sir. Absolutely. And so um, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk with Macho, everyone.